So, did you just get a new dog or do you have a dog that needs to work on some training skills? My name is Kate Malionic and I am a dog trainer in Massachusetts and I'm here to help you figure out what first steps to take in starting to train your dog. The first thing you're gonna wanna figure out is do you wanna hire a professional dog trainer like myself or do you wanna do the training yourself. Training your dog should be as much of a habit as it is a skill. Just like getting outside into nature or exercise or eating healthy. It's a good habit to get into. Doing a little bit every day, not just for your dog, but for you. If your dog's skills are up to par, you can be a lot more happy and a lot less frustrated. So if you decide to hire a dog trainer, they can be a really good guide like any other trainer to help you really get into a routine and give you a little bit more guidance as to where to start where to go next. Training doesn't stop just because your sessions with your trainer have ended. A good trainer will train you so that you can keep training your dog and proofing their skills for the rest of their life. Okay, so pretend you are hiring a trainer. What do you look for? How do you know which trainer is a good trainer? This is where you get to ask some hard hitting questions. Like, where were they educated? Where were they trained? And what are those schools' methods? Do they use formal education or do they just do training? I always recommend that you make sure that you get a trainer with formal education. And by formal education, I mean reading books and studies. Lots of books and studies. A trainer with a lack of formal education is like getting a teacher for your kid who's never studied how kids learn. Getting a trainer with formal education will more likely ensure that they understand canine cognition, animal welfare, animal behavior, canine body language, and the most important thing, learning theory. Most likely these trainers will rely on positive reinforcement, which brings us to our next question. What methods are you gonna go with? Personally, I'm biased because I have the knowledge about all of the effects of aversive methods to decide that positive reinforcement is a safer option for any dog of any level of training. Some dog trainers will tell you that aversives include prong collars, choke chains, and e-collars. But in my opinion, aversives include more than that. The actual definition of aversive is to cause strong dislike or a reluctance or lack of enthusiasm. So I base aversives off of what science has told us makes dogs emotionally distressed. Dogs can be distressed over really minimal things like yelling or standing over their head. Aversives are anything that cause discomfort mentally, emotionally, or physically to benefit the human's satisfaction of the dog's behavior. I should add that when I'm talking about discomfort, I'm talking about intentionally inflicted discomfort. Every living thing is going to experience some form of discomfort sometime in their lifetime. Our job with our dogs is to minimize that as much as possible and that is taking care of the welfare of your dog. In my idea of aversives, I include sprays, citronella collars, and I even consider electric fences aversive methods. My goal with being a dog trainer in general is to encourage people to really connect with their dogs and create a stronger bond. And there's no connection if you use aversive methods. So if you decide to go with using aversives to train your dog, you're only practicing management and you're not actually teaching your dog anything. Management is what you use when you are not able to train the dog in that situation. The definition of train is to teach a skill through practice and instruction over a period of time. Aversives are all about containing the behavior of your dog, not teaching them new behaviors that you prefer. They also don't follow the guidelines of animal welfare, but I recommend that all dog owners know the five freedoms of animal welfare. Unfortunately, aversives violate a number of them. What? But Katie, what about aversive therapy? That's legal, that's a thing. If you actually listen to people who have done aversive therapy or conduct aversive therapy, you'll know that it's not actually enjoyable. Not only that, but humans are able to give consent whether something is hurting them or making them uncomfortable. And dogs don't have that, which is why it should not even be a question as to using aversives on your dogs. There's enough information in scientific studies to not only conclude that aversive methods significantly increase 
cortisol levels. Cortisol levels are stress hormones, but the findings are alarming enough that all veterinary groups and animal behavior groups have advised against using any type of aversive methods for any type of dog in any type of situation. What is a veterinary group or a behavior, an animal behaviorist group? These groups aren't just animal lovers. They're not just PETA fanatics. These are doctors, people with PhDs who have dedicated their lives to studying animals so that we treat them correctly. So if you wanna rush training or if you don't think that dogs actually experience emotion, uh, ignoring all of the science, of course, or if you don't care about the welfare of your dog or inducing anxiety, fear, stress, you're probably gonna go with aversive methods. Now, I can't stop you from doing that. I don't, I don't have that power, but all I can do is tell you what I know and what other people a lot smarter than me know and a lot smarter than you know. Aversives inevitably cause setbacks, mistakes, and they have been linked to worse behavior in dogs with behavioral issues. What positive reinforcement training can do for you is prevent you from making mistakes. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, but they're gonna be much less significant so that your dog is set up for as much success as possible. What positive reinforcement trainers do is go slow enough for the dog. They start at the dog's level and they stay at the dog's level while challenging them just enough to keep the dog comfortable. That is what creates confidence. And the more confidence your dog has, the more confidence you will have and the much more happy and calm both of you guys will be throughout your training journey. If you're looking to create as little stress and fear and anxiety. Because let's be honest, to work with a dog who has anxiety can be very stressful, especially when you don't have a lot of experience with it. So if you wanna reduce that as much as possible, you're gonna wanna go with positive reinforcement training, whether you train them yourself or use a dog trainer. You have to be putting in as much work as the trainer and you have to be doing a little bit every day, five minutes at a time, not even. And your life is going to have to change a little bit. You're not just fitting them into your lifestyle, you're trying to, you need to be able to fit into their lifestyle as well. It has to be a marriage. You gotta come together, meet in the middle because someone's needs are going to be left out if you just focus on what you want or if you just focus on what the dog wants. Both are important. Your needs are important and your dog's needs are important. So meet in the middle. Here she comes. Come on in. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> hey. You need to help me? Hi, buddy. You need to know is that aversives are gonna are my co-host is making noise. <laughs>